and welcome to Word Magazine number 150. In this Word Magazine, I want to share with you a new resource, a book that I have recently completed under the title, John Owen on Scripture, Authority, Inspiration, Preservation. And this book comes from our publishing ministry, which is Trumpet Books and we completed this right at the end of December in 2019. It is a paperback and it is 157 pages in length. Uh, we completed again this book right at the end of last year in December 2019. Uh, there have already been a few people who have gotten hold of it, uh, even though we have really not done anything to promote it as yet. Um, and I am happy to do this Word magazine where hopefully we will let people know about this uh, book and there might be people who can use it as a resource. It is available right now on Amazon.com. If you search uh, by my name, Jeffrey T. Riddle, and the title of the book, John Owen on Scripture, uh, you should be able to find it. Uh, on the back cover of the book, uh, in the About This Book section, it reads, John Owen on Scripture, Authority, Inspiration, Preservation, begins with an introductory essay examining the bibliology of the influential Puritan theologian John Owen, who lived from 1616 to 1683, followed by a simplification and abridgment of two key essays from Owen on Scripture. First, the divine original of the scripture, and second, a vindication of the integrity and purity of the Hebrew and Greek text of the scripture. So that's a little blurb on the back cover uh, relating to about this book. So uh, that lays out pretty clearly that the, this book consists of three parts. First, there's an introductory essay, which I wrote on John Owen's bibliology. Second, there is an abridgment and simplification of Owen's essay, uh, which we could abbreviate as the divine original. And then third, there's an abridgment and simplification of Owen's essay that I might abbreviate uh, by calling it a vindication. Uh, if you attended the Text and Canon conference that was held in Atlanta back in October of last year, uh, you know that I made mention of this book project. I shared with folk that I was working on this, and I thought we were going to get it out uh, more quickly that, uh, than we ended up uh, getting it completed. Um, but we've, we're finished with it now, and I do think that this could prove to be uh, a good work, a profitable work for those who are interested in the whole text and translation uh, or confessional text movement. Uh, I read the essays that I have simplified and abridged in this volume uh, from John Owen probably over 15 years ago, and those essays were very influential in shaping my views on the text of Scripture, very influential in helping me to understand uh, how the godly men of John Owen's age saw the matter of the doctrine of Scripture and how they focus on the preservation of Scripture and not the reconstruction of Scripture. Um, and so uh, I, I think this book, again, will be very helpful for those who are interested in this issue. It's th these two essays that I've simplified and abridged have probably been two of the most influential works, uh, again, in shaping my thought on these matters. So, uh, without any further ado, let's move on to a reading of the introduction to this new book, John Owen on Scripture, Authority, Inspiration, Preservation, and the introduction is titled, John Owen on Scripture. This book is a simplification and abridgment of two works by the Puritan John Owen, who lived from 1616 to 1683, on the topic of Scripture which appear in volume 16 of his collected works of the divine original authority, self-evidencing light and power of the scriptures and a vindication of the purity and integrity of the Hebrew and Greek texts of the Old and New Testament. Owen published these two essays in English in 1659 
along with a third work in Latin titled Pro Sacris Scripturis Ex Ercationes Adversus Fanaticos, given the descriptive English title in the Gould edition, Some Exercitations About the Nature and Perfection of the Scripture, the Right Interpretation, Internal Light, Revelation, etc., after reading Owen, one is indeed left with nothing but admiration for his breadth of learning and expertise in so many disciplines. He was a true polymath. On Owen's Bibliology A word also needs to be said about Owen's Bibliology, or his theology of the Bible, including some of his more controversial views on text, especially regarding the vowel points and accents of the Hebrew Bible. As the subtitle of this book indicates, Owen's views on the Bible, as expressed in these works, may be placed under three headings, authority, inspiration, and preservation. First, Owen upheld the complete authority of the Bible as the infallible Word of God. Second, Owen held that this unique authority and infallibility came through its immediate inspiration by God in the original languages of Hebrew and Greek. Scripture is Theonoustos, God breathed, as it says in 2 Timothy 3.16. Owen can even freely use the language of divine dictation to describe how the Bible came about. The biblical authors were, he said, like the pen in the hand of the expert writer, or like an instrument of music, giving sound according to the hand, intention, and skill of the musician. According to Owen, the authority of the Bible comes not through the witness of the church, but through the witness of the Holy Spirit. Owen affirmed the plenary, verbal inspiration of Scripture, maintaining that every jot and tittle was from God and under his providential care. Scripture is self-authenticating, autopistos, since God's light shines through it. Third, with regard to the text of the Bible, Owen held that though the original autograph, the autograph of Scripture, had been allowed by God to perish, the Bible had been faithfully and fully preserved in God's all-wise providence in the existing copies, the Apographa. Unlike the approach that would later develop in modern text criticism, Owen did not advocate a scholarly reconstruction of the original autographa of the text of the Bible. Instead, he held to the providential preservation of the Bible in the extant Apographa. Owen's commitment to defend the preservation of the divine original in those copies also led him to reject emerging efforts to offer corrections to the traditional text based on versional evidence, whether from the Latin Vulgate, the Septuagint, or the other ancient translations, as reflected in the appearance of Brian Walton's Biblia Polyglotta. 1654 to 1657, the celebrated multi-volume edition of the Bible in various ancient languages. Owen likewise rejected suggested emendations to the traditional text based on the study of textual variants or on scholarly conjectures. Owen's writing often reflects his, reflects his apologetic interest in refuting Roman Catholics who pointed to textual variants in Scripture in order to argue for the need of the Church's authoritative judgment in establishing and interpreting the true text and to uphold the authority of the Latin Vulgate. He also defended the faith against free-thinking skeptics who reveled in the discovery and publication of supposed transmission errors in Christian Scripture. Many would suggest that the most controversial aspect of Owen's bibliology came in his views of the Hebrew vowel points and accents, especially as reflected in the second work, A Vindication of the Integrity and Purity of the Hebrew and Greek Texts of Scripture. In this essay, Owen defended the traditional Masoretic texts of the Hebrew Bible as the authoritative, inspired, and divinely preserved text. This included a defense not only of the antiquity and authority of the consonantal text, but also of the vowel points and accents. The early Protestant reformers had adopted the traditional Jewish view that the vowel points and accents were an authentic and original part of the preserved Masoretic texts of the Hebrew Bible, extending back to the time of Moses, Ezra, and the men of the great synagogue. 
This view was challenged in 1538 by the Jewish scholar Elias Levita, who lived from 1469 to 1549, in his work Maseret Ha Maseret. Levita argued that the vowel points and accents had been a later invention and addition by the Masoretic scribes. Roman Catholic theologians seized on this development to attack the Protestant view of sola scriptura, arguing that corruptions in the text required the guidance of the Latin Vulgate and authoritative church interpretation. The influential and respected Protestant Hebraeus, Johannes Buxtorf, and the, the elder, who lived from 1564 to 1629, and his son, Johannes Buxtorf the Younger, who lived from 1599 to 1664, responded by defending the traditional view of the vowel points. What many considered to be a devastating critique of the traditional view, however, came in 1624 with the publication of a work titled Arcanum Punctuanionis Revelatum, The Mystery of the Points Revealed, by the French philologist Louis Capel, who lived from 1585 to 1658. What made matters worse for the defenders of the antiquity and authenticity of the vowel points was that Capel was a fellow Protestant. Owen was well aware of this controversy and of Capel's scholarly work, yet he tenaciously persisted in defense of the traditional view of the vowel points and accents. It was Owen's determined defense of the Hebrew vowel points and his impassioned warnings against what he believed to be excessive emphasis on the compilation of variants in Walton's Polyglotta that led some later readers and editors to question the value of these essays, especially a vindication of the integrity and purity of the Hebrew and Greek texts of Scripture. Thomas Chalmers, 1780-1847, gave the following assessment of the conflict between the most learned Walton and what he called the most talented and zealous Owen. Here's a quote from Chalmers. The latter, Owen, adventured himself most rashly into combat, and under a false alarm for the results of the erudition of the former Walton, and the former Walton retorted contemptuously upon his, attag upon his antagonist, as he would upon a mystic or enthusiastic devotee. End quote. Chalmers suggested that the amalgamation of Walton's wisdom of the letter and Owen's wisdom of the spirit would have produced a perfect theologian. Instead, their conflict issued, he said, in what was most revolting, the lordly insolence of the prelate or the outrageous violence of the Puritan. According to Chalmers, Owen was illiterate with regard to textual studies and lagging far behind Walton in his knowledge of the vocables. Chalmers lamented that there could not be a compound of Walton's philology, research, and classic or antiquarian attainments with Owen's faith, ardor, and profound intelligence. Though admiring of Owen's piety, Chalmers held that he was outmatched by Walton's mastery of textual scholarship. A similar conclusion is reached by Gould in his prefatory note to Owen's second essay, as he observes, on the minute and multifarious details of biblical literature, our author, Owen, assuredly must yield the palm to Walton. In his contention that the points were part of Scripture, and as sacred and ancient as the other elements of the text, Gould concedes that Owen may have erred. He adds, Owen erred also in betraying a nervous sensitive to sensitiveness, lest an imposing array of various readings should invalidate the authority of the sacred text. This negative assessment has been shared, repeated, and expanded by later interpreters. Stanley N. Gundry suggests that the great Puritan divine's clash with Walton was the one occasion during Owen's long and illustrious career that he left the field of battle undeniably vanquished. According to Gundry, Owen's views on this topic are characterized by inconsistency and contradiction with the only viable conclusion being that Owen st stated his position poorly, did contradict himself, and wrote in a panic. Richard A. Muller argues that the rationalizing character of the orthodox treatment of the vowel points, especially in Owen, 
left the orthodox system easy prey to the inroads of rationalism in the next century. According to Muller, Owen assumed the authority, infallibility, and integrity of the text on doctrinal grounds, and then had predicated his attack on the new text criticism of Capel and Walton on his doctrine. Owen's defense of the antiquity of the vowel points in particular, according to Muller, would prove a source of of profound difficulty and embarrassment for orthodoxy in the next two centuries, but also would mark a shift in the basic character and implication of his doctrine. Such negative assessments of Owen's bibliology, however, have also been challenged. Theodore P. Letus argued that Owen's attack on Walton's polyglotta was a sage and prescient anticipation of the threats represented by the emerging discipline of modern text criticism against the Protestant Reformed doctrine of the immediate inspiration of Scripture in the original languages and the providential preservation of Scripture in the process of textual transmission. More recently, Old Testament scholar Russell T. Fuller has made the case that Owen and his Protestant colleagues who defended the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible, including the antiquity and authenticity of the vowel points and accents, deserve a fresh evaluation, suggesting Although they stumbled in details, Owen and his colleagues were correct on the core issues, the preservation of scripture, the verbal inspiration of the scriptures, and the dangers of a textual criticism that creates its own text. Even Gundry, who harshly described Owen as a confused man, acknowledges that the real point of his insistence on on the authenticity of the vowel points was that the meaning of a word depended on the vocalization of its Hebrew consonants. What is more, it might well be argued that the recent scholarship on the Masoretic text and its reading tradition has vindicated, at least to some degree, Owen's arguments in favor of the antiquity of the Masoretic text and its vocalization system. As Cambridge Hebraist Jeffrey Kahn has observed, contrary to a view that is still widely held today, The reading tradition was not a medieval creation of the Masoretes, but was an ancient tradition that the Masoretes regarded, but recorded rather, by their notation system. According to Kahn, the linguistic roots of this vocalization system go back to at least the time of the Second Temple. Conclusion. My primary goal in completing this project has been to introduce and even to encourage the revival of Owen's theology of the Bible for a new generation. Owen's theology of Scripture reflected the views put forward in chapter 1 in the Westminster Confession of Faith. He did not suggest that the text of Scripture was preserved through scholarly reconstruction, but through divine preservation. Owen was an influential theologian and scholar in his own generation, advancing a distinct confessional and reformed view of Scripture as reflected in the Savoy Declaration of 1658, of which he was a principal author, and the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689, whose framers were much influenced by and filled with admiration for Owen. Of particular interest is Owen's response to the rise of modern text criticism and his defense of the traditional or confessional text of Scripture. It is my hope that this work might make some contribution to the revival of such a perspective.